don't know whether I'm ready for this. <laughs> However, you seem glad enough to see me, and maybe that'll do. We could just stand and, or sit and look at each other all afternoon. <laughs> Done my day. Thank you so much. And I must say, this has been an adventure just getting into this room. We've been all, you know this hotel, we've been outside lost. We had all the kitchen staff giving us 20 different ways of getting in. And it has been something, but we finally made it. Thank you. That was actor John from Frid introducing himself to fans at the 2007 Dark Shadows Festival. Fred is best known for playing vampire Barnabas Collins on the daytime drama Dark Shadows, which left the airwaves in 1971. A classically trained stage actor, Fred brought a sense of gravitas to a villain originally intended to meet a violent death a few months after his introduction in 1967. Fred's plan, at the time, was to take the job, save a little money, and travel to California to pursue a career in teaching. Instead, he became a pop icon that soon saw his likeness appearing on the cover of Tiger Beat magazine, board games, trading cards, and Viewmaster reels. When the series ended, though, Fred was left to sort out a career he'd grown bored with. He cared for neither celebrity nor horror stories, which left him with few professional options at the dawn of the 1970s. So, Fred brought a premature end to his mainstream acting career and spent the rest of his life pursuing projects on the stage whenever the mood would strike him. He passed away in April last year, a few months before making his final screen appearance in Tim Burton's Dark Shadows film. But it took a few days for some media outlets to note his passing. The actor, who'd retired to his hometown in Ontario, Canada, had been out of the public eye for so long that many assumed he'd been dead for years. His fans, though, had not forgotten. For a day, the hashtag Jonathan Fred even trended on Twitter, another moment of celebrity that would have baffled him had he been alive to see it. A few of us here at the Historical Society, namely myself, Patrick McCrae, and David Elijah Namod, have spent the last few months chasing stories about the actor. We spoke to his colleagues on Dark Shadows, as well as many of his friends and collaborators who worked with him in the years since the show was cancelled. So, sit back, pour yourself some sherry, and let's talk about Jonathan Fritt. Sharon Smythe Lentz joined the cast of Dark Shadows in 1967. Only nine years old, she was cast as the younger sister of Barnabas Collins. My very first meeting with Jonathan Fred, he was not in costume. He was just a big guy. And I remember he had very dark eyes and very big hands and a real big flashy smile. And again, I use the term bigger than life because I was a little, little girl. And physically, he was just looming over me, but gentle at the same time. And I remember his laughter. I remember him crossing his legs and sitting back in the chair very casually and laughing at whatever the grown-ups were talking about. But I knew right from the get-go that I wasn't afraid of him. So therefore, when he went into makeup and costume and had that look, I wasn't, I, I could see right past that. I knew who was underneath of it. So it didn't bother me at all. It was very, very comfortable. Uh, anyone that was in, in costume at that time I knew who they were, so I was not intimidated. To be honest with you, I wasn't intimidated by any of the adult actors because they were very welcoming to me and didn't treat me like I was disposable. And that, that always left a really good feeling for me. Marie Wallace played several characters on Dark Shadows, but it wasn't until years after the show was canceled that she really got to know Jonathan Fred. Well, we first met on Dark Shadows, and of course... Uh, I worked on Dark Shadows for two years in my three different characters. However, we really got to know each other in later years when we started going to the conventions. Because during, during Dark Shadows, I had a wonderful time with him on, on the set and everything and in rehearsals, but we never, I never socialized with him. And, uh, but the Dark Shadows Festival started, and then, of course, we did, and he started to do his one-man shows. He was writing them and really testing them out in many ways at the conventions. And then, of course, I lived in New York, and, and so did he, and he would start doing them then in libraries and schools all around town. 
and whenever he he would, he'd call me and tell me about it, and I'd always go, and there'd always be a flock of Dark Shadows fans, of course, and afterwards, he and I, and maybe Louis Edmonds, and a few dear friends, Nancy, and people like that, would all go out to a kind of celebratory dinner, and uh, so that's when I really got to know him. Actress Donna Wandre joined the cast of Dark Shadows in 1970 as Roxanne Drew, the last great romantic foil of Barnabas Collins. I was called in in 1970 when they were making the Dark Shadows movie. And Jonathan wasn't around as often because they were all shooting the film. So I read for Dan Curtis, and I never met Jonathan before. I believe I worked with him. And for the first time, and I must say it was it was uh, terrifying for me. I was what twenty two or twenty three years old when I was on this. I had absolutely never done a soap before, and the the whole thing was terrifying. Uh, so I I don't remember the first meeting. I remember that I just didn't want to make mistakes, and I wanted to fit in and be quiet and just do my job and not mess up my lines and that's all I remember for probably the first month but I do recall that he called me into his dressing room after I was on the show for about a month and we had several directors all of them wonderful but one of them was would really pick on the new kid now I didn't know that I thought that that was just me, that I was doing something wrong, that I wasn't bright enough or fast enough or, well, whatever. And Jonathan called me in because he could see that I was very upset, these dressing downs every day. And he said, and I, I wrote it down so I would remember it, he said, you're the new kid. He always picks on the new kid. Say something back to him next time. And... <laughs> I think the next time I said something like, really? That's it. That's all I could get out of my mouth. And then he <laughs> stopped picking on me. I will never forget the kindness. You know, and by then somebody else had come in, so there was a new person he could, you know, pick on. But it, I, I just thought, oh, my God, this is, this is so not uplifting. This is awful. I, I just feel like I'm berated every day. And... That, that Jonathan just really come in, sit down, close the door, and said, look, I'm going to tell you how it is. And I just, from then on, I was fine. I was just absolutely fine, and I knew if there was a problem, and there never was, but I knew if there was a problem, I could go to him and ask. Elena and the Canther was among the Dark Shadows fans referred to as the Studio Girls. These were young fans of the show in New York City who got to be friends with Fred, eventually helping him plan events and manage fan mail. The first time that I ever met him was actually at an A&S fashion show in 1968 because my uncle got me into the show and backstage. But the problem with that was I wasn't allowed to talk to him. I could just sit there and watch. So my effort was to go to the studio to meet him. So I finally met him at the Dark Shadows studio later on that year, and uh, it was really weird. He um, autographed my scrapbook, my red scrapbook that I used to uh, bring around with me with all sorts of stories about him and pictures and stuff that I collected from teen magazines. And he autographed it, and he asked my name. And then the next time that I met him, he actually remembered my name, and he asked me to come into the studio because he wanted to look at the scrapbook. And that's what started my whole adventure with him. He asked me to go out to have a bite to eat with him that night, and then asked me if I wanted to help answer his fan mail. Jonathan Fred not only participated in Laura Parker's audition for Dark Shadows, he also offered advice to help her better understand the nature of her character, the witch Angelique. I, I, I was brought to the studio to uh, audition for the role of Angelique, and... Uh, I was given the, the love scene, the first love scene, in which um, he has told her that he can't marry her, that he's going to marry her mistress, Josette, and uh, she begs him to stay with her and tells him how much she loves him. It was just a, there was no indication that she was 
she could cast spells or that she was in any way supernatural. She was just a, a girl who had been rejected, a servant. And uh, so he was. He had uh, filmed the show, well, he had shot the show that day, taped, I guess we say. He had taped the show that day, and he was still on the set, so they asked him to do the scene with me and two other actresses who were also auditioning. And uh, he was wonderful to me. He was very kind, very warm. We went through the scene together on camera, and then he he leaned in and he whispered in my ear, I, uh, uh, I guess you know, she's a witch. And uh, I said, oh, really? And he said, yes, she's, you know, evil. So I turned and looked at the camera with uh, a look of scorn and, uh, you know, hell hath no fury as a woman scorned. And she... <laughs> And I think that got me the part because uh, I had have these great big eyes and uh, and you know thanks to what he said I kind of turned on the witchiness and uh, it was great I got the part I I uh, was walking down the hall to leave and the hairdresser came running after me and started tugging on my hair and saying what are we gonna do with this <laughs> and I realized I'd gotten the part. <laughs> So it was a it was a wonderful um, you know it's a day I'll never forget and he was so very kind he actually whispered to me I hope you get it and uh, uh, that gave me courage too during the reading you know he was kind enough to say I hope you get it he may have said that to the other two girls as well <laughs> but I found out pretty quickly that he was he had a hard time memorizing his lines and that he often went up on camera and glanced over at the teleprompter. He never, there's a trick to memorizing lines, and I don't think he ever learned it. You know, you have to create inner dialogue that is completely motivated and connected so that you always know what you're going to say next, even if you don't know the exact words. And he just memorized his lines. And he he told me once that he had, sometimes in the, when he had done Shakespeare in college, he'd, he'd He'd launch into lines from Henry V right in the middle of Macbeth, but he he never lost his his presence, and even when he went up, as, as actors say it, you know, he, his 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 what would you say his hysterical horror at the fact that he'd forgotten his lines, his his agony and his misery and his 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 what's the word, and up just being, you know, very, very inter- upset inside, always played into the character. And it looked like Barnabas was the one who was horrified and anxious and and terrified and very, very upset. So it worked for the camera. I mean, it worked for the character really well. And, and uh, I think it gave him, gave him even more appeal because we'd watch the show afterwards and we'd think it was going to be abysmal and it would be just marvelous. He would always be marvelous with his his Shakespearean demeanor and his uh, his strong presence. Fritz's problems with lines weren't a secret to either the audience or his cast members. You know, I, I say this with, with great good humor, and, and I, we all remember this. I mean, he was forever looking for, looking for a teleprompter, and uh, so he didn't have that attitude of, I'm better than anybody. I know how to do this I'm better than you. I, he just knew what he had to do in front of a camera to get uh, the most effective work on screen. And um, but not not him. He he didn't have any airs about him at all. No, I was very comfortable with him. Nicanther said Fritz's troubles memorizing lines colored his early opinions of his performance on the show. You see, sometimes he got upset because, you know, the show was actually taped live, and they didn't do any editing. And since he was a slow study, sometimes he didn't remember some of his lines. And he would get very embarrassed and think that it was a horrible, horrible thing that he would stutter or stammer or make a mistake on a line, and that that would be in the show. But all in all, I mean, with the character that he did, he finally realized, you know, I really did uh, 
build this character and make it feel real and, and not just a monster, but actually a man with problems and, and had depth. So, I mean, over the years he did grow to appreciate what he did with the character. You see, you have to understand, he, he watched some of the shows and the scripts that he, he, he actually was in, he really didn't go from A to Z in the script. He would only know his part, so he really didn't know the story that well. So when he finally sat down and watched the show, he actually saw how good it was. Beginning in the 1980s, Nancy Kersey went to work for Jonathan Fritz production company, Clunes Associates. Kersey said Fritz's preoccupation with learning his lines eclipsed everything else once the video started to roll. I think he was just so concerned of getting the, the lines out of his mouth that he didn't... He wasn't concerned about that. Like, he would never be concerned. He was often asked, who do you think Barnabas should be with, Josette or Angelique? And, uh, and he couldn't give a damn. I mean, it was whatever <laughs> the writers wrote it. I mean... It didn't matter to him. Um, yeah, it was just just to make Barnabas, uh, you know, speak <laughs> without stumbling over himself was was all that he cared about. Actress Catherine Lee Scott says for its presence on Dark Shadows gave its anti-hero a credibility it might have lacked with another performer. Jonathan was a real actor, and and over the years, of course, we with the books and and the anecdotes, the behind the scenes things. You know, there are certain things that uh, quirkiness is that each of us are known for. And with Jonathan, it's always hinged on on um, on his lines. Yeah, he had a little trouble with lines. Uh, but he was a real actor. And his joy was just going in in the morning and, and working. Um, he cared about uh, the character of Barnabas Collins. And he, um, there were, there were things that he insisted upon, uh, relevant so to you know his characterization, uh, so that Barnabas had humanity and had a certain elegance and had a uh, oh um, and there was a theatricality to the performance uh, along with that very human side that he brought to the character. So. Um, uh, it's only when, when we think back on what he was doing <laughs> that we realize, you know, how, in other hands, uh, how that character may not have worked, put it that way. And one of the things that I'm happy about is that, um, you know, Jonathan always wanted to be uh, respected for the new things that he was doing. He hated looking back. The Canther says neither Fred nor the Dark Shadows producers were prepared for the audience response to Barnabas Collins. When I started answering the fan mail, they were already backlogged by a, a couple of years already. And uh, we just kept up with the um, recent ones, you know, whichever ones came in that, that particular week we answered. And that's what led to the fan mail parties. Those fan mail parties were to get all the backlog letters uh, answered because there were so many. I mean, you had to see when, when you walked into that room. We we had worked on this for months to to figure out how we were going to do this fan mail party, and we did it in the rehearsal hall at the studio. And there were boxes from A to Z all around the studio, and they were piled almost up to the ceiling with mail bags. That's how much mail there was. And we worked on this mail for so many weeks that Dan Curtis finally said enough, and Jonathan had to uh, rent out a conference room at the Hotel Edison for us to finish it up. That's how bad it was. Wandry remembers that Fritz's celebrity was sometimes surreal. Sometime into the show, uh, they had asked me to do a publicity with him in Milwaukee, and it was at the auto show. And... I had never been treated to anything like that before, and I don't think I had ever been flown first class any place. I mean, even to Milwaukee. Uh, but you know, you, you were flown first class. You were um, supposed to be on schedule to do things, but people picked you up. I mean, it was oh, for me, this is phenomenal. I, I but Catherine Lee Scott had sold me an outfit to wear. 
and she came in one day and she said, you, you're going to need something for these things. And it was a burgundy jumpsuit covered in sequins and a burgundy and white jacket. And they said, yep, that's what you're going to wear. So it fit. It looked, it looked great. I was so happy that she was tired of it. And so that's what I brought along. And then when I got there, I saw the Milwaukee paper, and it said the auto show. And Jonathan Frid, Tiny Tim, Miss Vicky, and Arnold the Pig. And I had to sit on the front of a car while it spun around all day, and people took pictures of me. Meanwhile, Jonathan was standing across the show with people lining up for his autographs until, you know, his hand was going to fall off. And then we all had to go out to dinner together. And I just looked at him, and he looked at me, and he said, don't worry. To have dinner with Tiny Tim and Miss Vicky, we all sat on the floor together. I think at that point, even Jonathan was like, we're sitting on the floor. And Milwaukee is not known for vegetarian food in 1970. But we found mm. one because Tiny Tim and Miss Vicky were vegetarians. And we sat on the floor at this place and basically tried to eat this food, which and I'm, I'm basically a vegetarian now, but th that was very different food. And when we left, I remember that Jonathan and I uh, went down to the hotel we were staying at and we ate food. It was like we weren't going to make it another day. We, we didn't even talk. It was just like, could we please eat food now? Nicanther says the cast of Dark Shadows turned into folk heroes in New York City when the show was on the air. Sometimes when you went, especially when it was a school holiday and you were outside the studio, there had to be at least 100 kids there. It was, it was a nightmare. Most of the time, Jonathan would go out through the back if there were too many there because it would just be bedlam. But uh, on a normal basis, if there was like 20 or 30 kids out there, it was fine. He would sign all the autographs, and he'd be really nice to everyone. And it was just, you know, you got to know all the kids because you were there. So I made lifelong friends at the Dark Shadow Studio. I'm still friends with, with uh, two of the, three of the people that I met there. Wandry says many of his Dark Shadows castmates really only knew Jonathan Frid during that celebrity period of his career. Um, I wish I knew more of his stage work or had been around to see it because I do believe his son was on the stage and in Shakespeare. It was just one of his great, great loves. Um, I, I still think that uh, probably he is the first person that um, was a pop icon. Um, I think he was one of the first and only people from television that will be remembered that way. He changed the face of certainly daytime. Uh, mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, he just uh, changed the face of how, uh, at the time we did call them soaps, but how daytime shows were, what they looked like, what they sounded like. Um, and And I think that uh, it probably wouldn't make him particularly happy because I think his heart was in theater and far more serious fare. But I do think he was the first uh, pop icon on television. Nikatha was a teenager when she started managing Fred's Dark Shadows fan mail. She said she was unprepared for how bizarre the letters sometimes were. Oh, God, the strangest letter was this woman, she was a housewife. She wrote it on this black paper in red that made it look like blood. And she was convinced that he was a vampire. And she said that she slept in a coffin at night. It was, it was bizarre. <laughs> I mean, you know, here I am a teenager and I'm reading this from like a 34-year-old woman. And I'm saying to myself, are you kidding? You're, you're an adult and this is what you're writing? <laughs> <laughs> it was really funny. It was, it had, but he got very angry that we read some of the mail. He said, if the address is on the outside of the letter, don't read the letters. He said, because it's private, it's their thoughts, and only I'm supposed to see them. And I'm thinking to myself, you don't want to see half this stuff, I'm telling you. 
Despite these distractions, Frid was still focused on the work at hand. Parker said he wasn't afraid to step in when an actor was struggling with understanding what made their character tick. As the show progressed, you know, as the months went by, we became, you know, closer because we had so many scenes to do together. And, of course, I was the rejected servant girl. And I had always played ingenues and, uh, in, in plays. I'd always, you know, gotten the lead and played the ingenue. And uh, so I was kind of... I've kind of felt that Angelique was the heroine of the piece. And he leaned, and I, you know, I did a lot of crying. And he, he said to me once, you know, you should really stop crying because you're the heavy. You're the villain. And I went, oh. He said, yeah. He said, you know, I said, well, oh, I don't know. I don't, I don't really know. I've never been jealous. I mean, I've, I've always gotten any boy I wanted. And he said, you have to plum roll. He said, you have the role everyone wants. And he said, dig deeper because you will really enjoy playing it if you, you know, if you find that, that, that anger and that desire for revenge deep down inside of you. So it took me a while, but after a while I began to realize he was right. And it was very, very good advice because I think then the, the character of Angelique began to grow and become more, you know, have more dimen more levels, more dimension. Many of the people involved with Dark Shadows went their separate ways once shooting wrapped for the 1971 feature film Night of Dark Shadows. In the 1980s, Frid returned to the stage with both one-man performances and a leading role in the touring production of Arsenic and Old Lace. These, coupled with a return to the airwaves of Dark Shadows reruns, brought him back in touch with old friends. That also made him some new ones. I lost touch with Jonathan in the 70s, but then in the early 80s, I happened to see that there that he was going to be at Live at Five for uh, you know because Dark Shadows was coming on again in New York, and I said to Valerie, "Wouldn't it be a hoot? Let's go and meet him at uh, at Live at Five and say hello to him because it's been a long time." And so we went there, and it was it was hilarious. He comes out from the interview. We were waiting by the NBC elevators. And the first thing he says, girls, why didn't you just come up to the green room? And I looked at him. I said, Jonathan, this isn't back in Dark Shadows. They don't allow you to do that anymore. It was hilarious. You know, so we got to, and that's when I got in touch with him again. And as it turned out, you know, I started working in radio. So I used to have him on my, my uh, talk shows. I had him on the Soupy Sales show. I had him on with the Dolans, with Alan Combs, all of these different radio shows. And then, then uh, he asked me to get together a group of people to go to his apartment. That's when he was starting his one-man shows so that we could critique him while he was uh, reading the, the uh, stories. And that's how I got back in touch with him. Fred's return to the theater is also what led to his collaborations with Nancy Kersey. I... Um was a uh, Dark Shadows fan, and actually watching Jonathan made me want to uh, pursue theater in a professional way. I didn't really know you could do that uh, <laughs> until I started watching Dark Shadows, found out more about Jonathan, and I went on to, uh, to get a degree in theater in English. I became an advocate for the spoken word, and I went into the professional theater first in Philadelphia, and Jonathan was doing or developing um, a one-man show at a festival in 1984 in Newark, Delaware. Uh, I'm sorry, Newark, Newark, New Jersey. Newark, I'm sorry, Newark, New Jersey. And I went up to see it, and I just thought it was marvelous. Of course, I was a little afraid, Patrick, because usually those we admire as children when we grow up. They're not as hot as we thought they were. Well, believe me, he was everything and more. And I just thought he was so marvelous. And I wrote a, uh, a piece about it in a, a performing arts magazine I was writing for in Philadelphia. And I, and I said how terrific this was and what he was doing. The editor, as she normally did, sent out the reviews and sent a review to him. And he found out about me through Ann Wilson, who worked for the festivals and knew of me because I had written to her and put us in contact with each other. Nick Hather said Fred's one-man shows allowed him to explore material that was more personal. 
Mary O'Leary was his producer, and when they started the uh, one-man shows, and they would go over a bunch of different uh, authors and pieces to see which ones seemed to fit. And when he started, he did a lot of, um, like, Edgar Allan Poe and things like that, so there would be more in the horror vein, you know, so that people would associate it with Barnabas. But as it grew later and later, he he brought into it Shakespeare, which was like Richard III was his favorite. He loved to have that in the one-man show. And he got into some comedy. I think the funniest thing that he ever did was with his mother and the answering machine. I, I, I was rolling on the floor with that one. That was really hilarious. Well, my story here took place, oh, eight or nine years ago. It was early morning in my Manhattan apartment. It was my birthday, in fact, and I just stepped out to buy a paper. Meanwhile, my mother called me and then heard my voice recorded on my smart new answering machine saying, Hello, this is 535-3428. Please leave a message after you hear the beep. But when I returned, I saw that there were five messages on my machine. And all my friends called me in the last few minutes to wish me happy birthday. I didn't think they knew. I rewound anxiously and then hurried my mother into the corner of the voice. says Jonathan Fred was a far cry from the dour, depressed vampire he played on television. The thing I was impressed with so much was his voice, and he never lost that. He had the most mellifluous, beautiful voice that, um, and I could just hear him, even though I'd never seen him in any Shakespearean plays, I, I could just imagine him doing it. He, he was so dramatic, you know. It, you watch soaps sometimes, and people play so small and he was able to pull off this really larger than life character in a very very real way and that's that's no easy feat so that I admired so much in him professionally but as a person it was his kindness he was he was very kind and very very charming and very funny too and he would always throw me by his humor because looking at him i wouldn't expect him to be that funny i'd expect him to be very serious and yet he was quite funny very funny kersey said her relationship with fred evolved over the years even after age forced him to limit his public appearances what he had originally hired me for he and his uh manager uh, mary uh was to be a writer was to write uh some original material help edit material that they had purloined from books and other sources, and also help uh, do direct mail campaigns uh, for, for the production company, Clues Associates. What I did was, when Jonathan would do uh, the pieces, the stories, I would write the, I would do the segues, I would write the segues that would lead from one piece to the other. Uh, that's primarily what I did in the beginning. And when uh, after we had developed all uh, three shows, uh, there wasn't a whole lot for us to, to do. And Jonathan was started to ask me to help him with this, that and the other.
personal things. And it evolved to becoming a personal assistant, which I had never aspired to do, uh, but he just turned into that. And I didn't mind being with him because I thought he was a very funny man, and I liked him, so it worked out. The artist who calls herself Sherlock was another Dark Shadows fan that got involved with promoting Fred's later theater appearances. Well, the very first time was at uh, the Dark Shadows Festival in Newark in uh, 85. And uh, I had a pen pal who just said, come on up and we'll go to this convention. And I was starting out my artwork, and they had an art show, so why not? And uh, his, uh, they had the uh, autograph line, and I was terribly uh, shy so I wondered what on earth could I say, just stand in front of him and give him a piece of paper to sign. So, um, I'm used to running around the country. Uh, all, all my life we've moved a lot, so I always had to adapt. So my default thing was to draw something. So I spent the night before the autograph line drawing a picture of him, and when I got in line, I gave him the picture saying, you know, thank you for your autograph, here's something for you, kind of thing. And he started to uh, sign it, and he didn't know where to sign it, and I said, no, 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 it's for you. And then he took a look at it, and then he took a longer look at it, and he took a longer look at it, and I didn't know what was going on, and then he got his glasses out, and he started staring at it for a while, and in the meantime, everybody's waiting for their autographs and stuff, and he finally said, uh, thank you, uh, it was very nice, and life went on, but uh, when I got home from the convention, I had a letter waiting for me, and it said uh, basically that that was a wonderful thing, and thank you for the artwork and stuff like that, and I thought, wow, because I just said Sherlock originally and I didn't sign it and so he would have to either have hunted me down or had somebody hunt down who I was to find the address to write the letter to go through all that <laughs> it was just fun to work for him he was uh, aggravating at times because he was fickle that is he would uh, change his mind on everything he would I mean it wasn't a lie or anything he would just believe something firmly for this minute and then change his mind the next <laughs> so it would drive you crazy as an artist but he was cool and he was very very forthright so the one thing that made me love him the when i first went up to visit him is i took my portfolio and he looked through it and most people if they see something they don't like they'll either question you about it or they won't say anything about it at all and he would just say, that's wonderful, that's great, that's crap, that's crap, that's wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> and not, not knowing you at all, <laughs> just, just say it right to you. Jonathan Fred's fickle moods were just part of doing business, Kersey says. It was a lot of fun. It also could be very frustrating. There were many times that we both left each other very annoyed. Uh, but he, Jonathan wanted to try absolutely everything, uh, come approach a project from every possible angle. Uh, he was, cause he was so afraid that there'd be something he had left unexplored. That was frustrating to me being an ADHD person. <laughs> so, um, but he would let you have you meaning me. He let me have a big say into what he was going to ultimately include in the one man shows, which was, really something. I mean, here he was a vet, and here I was a newbie, and he took what I said very seriously, my suggestions very seriously. Uh, but we both had the same sense of humor and the same sense of what worked dramatically, what did not work dramatically, um, and how the pieces were placed together in the one-man shows for things that we both seemed to instinctively uh, know about each other when he was doing arsenic and old lace uh and at the same time doing his one-man shows he had sort of come back from the dead if you will because at the time when we were doing the one-man shows a problem we had was how to let people know a he was still alive and b uh you know remember him 
And when arsenic and all lace came about, uh, he got a lot of publicity. And at the same time, uh, his one man show had already been developed and he was getting work on his nights off a moment of, I'm sorry, arsenic and all lace doing the Monday nights in local libraries and theaters. And he was the happiest, the absolute happiest time of his life. Gary Sandy, perhaps best known for playing Andy Travis on WKRP in Cincinnati, starred opposite Fred in the production of Arsenic and Old Lace. My recollection of Jonathan Fred, when I worked with him in Arsenic and Old Lace in the uh, late 80s, um, it was a high-level production with Gene Stapleton, Marion Ross, Larry Storch, Jonathan Fred, myself, Gary Sandy, was that Jonathan Fred was a true gentleman a highly professionally trained actor. He was Canadian, um, had done a lot of things, and it was no mystery, really, that he became the success he did on Dark Shadows because he was that good of an actor. So when Barnabas Collins came around, they picked the right guy for that. Uh, Jonathan Frid was a class act. Jonathan Frid made his final screen appearance in Tim Burton's Dark Shadows. His cameo, as well as those of Dark Shadows cast members David Selby, Catherine Lee Scott, and Laura Parker, were at the invitation of both Burton and Johnny Depp. Four decades separated Fred's last two screen appearances, and Parker said age had taken its toll on him. We had discovered at the conventions he had become, um, you know, the kind of irascible, demanding person that one becomes in old age when you don't want to put up with anybody's nonsense anymore. And uh, mm-hmm. he... Um, He had to be sort of talked into going. He didn't want to go. He knew that he wasn't really strong enough to go. But he was talked into going. Jim Pearson talked him into going. And, of course, it wouldn't have happened. We wouldn't have gone if he hadn't gone. It wouldn't have happened. So um, when he got there, he, he wanted to go home. He wanted to go back to Canada. And... He actually got up the second morning, was there, and packed his bags and went down to the the hotel lobby and said, you know, call me a taxi. I'm going, I'm, you know, book me on an airplane. I want to go home. So he was, I think, feeling very um, uncomfortable. He had a hard time walking, you know, and he was, he was, he was disoriented, you know. He kept saying, where am I? Am I on the island? Um but we did, you know, we all got through it. <laughs> and I think he was, I think he, when he finally got to the set and he saw, he met Tim Burton and he met Johnny Depp and, and, you know, they were both incredibly kind to him. And Johnny Depp said, um, you know, kind of waved his arm at this magnificent set, which completely filled this giant studio. It completely rebuilt Collinwood and all its majesty. It was a chandelier the size of, your house, you know, huge stairway. I mean, it was all huge compared to what we had had on our set. And he said, none of this would be here if it weren't for you, Jonathan. They had both loved the show, and they had loved him when they were kids. So it was one of those magical moments when, uh, as we say, you know, Barnabas passed the baton, is that it? Pass the, what's torch, the word? Yeah. The torch. Um, pass the torch on. It's one of those magical moments when when Jonathan passed the torch to Johnny Depp. And of course now he has it back because <laughs> the movie was not the success that the TV show was. So. Actor David Selby joined the cast of Dark Shadows in 1968 as the roguish Quentin Collins. For the rest of the series, he and Fred took turns as the show's leading man, giving Fred some much needed time off. While the two were in England shooting their cameos for Tim Burton, though, Fred apologized to Selby. He admitted he had been quietly resentful of his co-star those many years ago. Yeah, he wanted to tell me that. Or obviously he wouldn't have. But it was quite touching, you know. I mean, uh, I helped him off a curb over there, <laughs> off the street. He took my arm, or I took his arm, I can recall him. That, that was quite touching. I, I I think I remember writing, but maybe I didn't. But I came back. We came back, and and I told Jonathan, "We'll be right back. Just wait here." I came back, and he wasn't there. <laughs> <laughs> he had wandered out another door. He was walking down, the, you know. 
Um, but I, it's very special. It was all very special because of the time we shot. So all of those kinds of things, Wallace, have never and can't go away. You know, it was just the period of time that we were in. And how the show was shot, and the people that were involved, uh, were all very, very committed uh, uh, to trying to pull this off, you know. From making up how we can make cobwebs, to finding smoke machines, you know, and all of the sets. All of those people were very special in their commitment to try and do what they were doing every day. So uh, I was just glad to be a part of it. And Jonathan, of course. The last time Donna Wandre saw Jonathan Frid was at a Dark Shadows Festival. I felt that he was diminished somewhat. I went over and I... I particularly wanted to reintroduce myself to him, but he was just so, uh, oh, there were just gaggles of people around him, you know, just just yeah. endless uh, lines of people just wanting to touch him and say hello or get one more autograph. But, you know, he gave me a big smile and, and you know, I, I gave him a hug and a kiss on the cheek and I said, I'm so glad to see you again. I don't know if, if you know, people, he particularly got it because there was just so much going on. But um, I was not on with him for anything there, and I just I just wanted to say hello to him. And it was right at the end of, it was the last day of the convention, so it was sort of overwhelming at the dinner. But I was so glad just to see him again. Even though Fred had a master's degree in directing from Yale, he only directed a single stage play, The Lion in Winter in 1993 with his Dark Shadows co-star Marie Wallace. I'm the only person that ever worked with him as, with him as a director because he did his directorial debut with me with The Lion in Winter down in um, Milledgeville, Georgia at the Georgia College. We lived together in the old governor's mansion, which was, you know, because Milledgeville was the um, capital of uh, Georgia back in the Civil War days. But uh, anyway, there's an old, original um, governor's mansion. It's now a, ma um, a museum on the, the, the first two floors. And then above, there are apartments. Well, not apartments, a whole you know, living quarters. And plus, the president of the Georgia College has his offices up there. So they put us up there, and we were there together for six weeks, and we had such fun. Oh, God, then you really get to know someone because there aren't a whole lot of other people around. You go to dinner together. We, a wonderful young man named David Moore was the one who invited us down there. He was the director of the uh, theater department, and um, his father, everybody there was so wonderful, his father so generously lent Jonathan, his beautiful Lincoln car that he had just bought. I think there were 50 miles on it. And so we had this beautiful car to drive all around Milledgeville and uh, go to rehearsals and, you know, go to the restaurants and just uh, just be together and really learn about each other. And we, we had a wonderful time. And, of course, doing that play was so wonderful. The last time I saw him was at uh, the convention. In, uh, and we spent a, a number of hours together at lunch and uh, sitting around just gabbing and a couple of times just in his hotel room talking with him. So when was that? That was not that long before. Whenever the last one was in, I believe it was in Hollywood. I'm only, we, we go back and forth, you know, from Hollywood to, to this coast. So it was probably not that long before he, uh, he he got sick. You know, he wrote the preface, not the preface, the foreword to my uh, my memoir. During the last years of his life, Fred was living in Hamilton, Ontario. 
It made contact with his American friends difficult, and he usually saw his dark shadows castmates during conventions. Sherlock was among those to make the trip north to visit him. Well, the last time I visited him in uh, Canada, I was bringing him some gifties, and uh, so he bent over to hug and give me a peck on the cheek, and I was wearing this big uh, cowboy hat, so he'd know that I was the, the Texan coming to visit him. And he's a tall guy, and I'm a short person, and so he bent over to give me the peck on the cheek, but he missed, and he hit me on the head with the, uh, I mean, hit the brim of the hat, so the brim of the hat fell over, so he plunged into my neck, and uh, that made him chuckle and made me giggle because he was doing the vampire bite right there. Since for its death, some of his friends have launched an effort to get his name on Canada's Walk of Fame. Well, last year, uh, Kathy Robbins had found out about this Canada Walk of Fame and started posting it on the different groups. And I had gotten to be friends with her in 2011 when I met her at one of the fests. And so this year, when he, when he didn't get in last year, because all she was doing was putting it on the groups and just asking people to nominate him, this year, what uh, I said to her was, we got to go all, if we're going to get him in this, we have to go all out. We have to get articles in uh, the Hamilton Spectator. We have to get a lot of publicity. We have to do posters to put, put up in the, the businesses that he frequented up in Canada. We have to get in touch with his uh, schools from up in Canada, Hillfield, McMaster's. I even got in touch with Yale to put on their uh, Facebook pages and to promote him. We sent posters to all of these people. We even uh, got in touch with the uh, Canadian loyalists and, uh, and got them to support him. And, of course, the Hamilton Foundation, the Hamilton Community Foundation is where uh, Jonathan left uh, most of his estate to. That's how much he, he felt for his native, uh, his native land and his hometown that he left it to the city of Hamilton, actually. So, I mean, no one deserves to be in this Walk of Fame more than he does. And, you know, we've just been going all out. And now as April 1st to April 30th, people have to go onto the website, onto www.canadaswalkoffame.com forward slash nominate, and they have to nominate him every day. Now, they threw us a curveball. They changed their nominating page today, which really, you know, I mean, they are a, um, they are a public foundation. You know, they get donations and everything. They are nonprofit. So they're supposed to abide by, you know, having people nominate. And they're suggesting like seven different people to be in the uh, Cineplex Legendary Award, which is the posthumous award. And they didn't mention, Jonathan, you know, no, all the publicity that we've been putting into it. So this is how it goes with the uh, nomination. It comes up on the page, and it says uh, nomination, and you put in his name. You have to put in your, your email address, and then there's a list under the Cineplex Awards of these seven people, and then it says other. You put in other, no matter what. Just put in the other, other as as Jonathan Frid, and and vote. Now the other thing that's going to confuse people in voting is that there is a contest going on to win tickets to Canada's Walk of Fame, but only people who live in Canada are eligible for it. But if you do not fill out your name and address on that, they will not submit your vote. So you have to fill out your name and address. And I'm telling you, you have to inundate these people with votes every single day, once a day through April 30th. You have to vote for him because if we flood them with votes, we could get him in. And that's what we want because this is an honor that he would want. More than anything else, he loved his country. And to get him this honor would be the most precious gift that we could give to him, our final gift to him, because we can't do anything else for him right now. A World War II veteran of the Canadian Navy, 
Fred never surrendered his citizenship, Kersey said. Canada. He was very, very proud of being a Canadian. Uh, and he never uh, gave up his citizenship. I mean, he was always on the green card in America. You know, the, the thing he brought, which many people have said so many times, he brought to to the horror genre or to the romantic mystery, mystery genre, the, the really deeply true idea that uh, a scary villain has to have more dimensions than just bloody teeth. I mean, yes. he has to have a, a, a sense of who he is and what he does. So that he's the full character in every, as, as all characters are in drama, you know, that he has good and evil and he has guilt and remorse and lust and and uh, that he strives for good even when he must do bad and, and he feels horrible when he has to go out and kill someone. Um, and the vampire itself, you know, has always been portrayed as a, as a creature of of evil, and I think Jonathan brought another side. He brought the side of of wanting desperately to at least to protect his family, and that made him a sympathetic character. I mean, if you can if you think about a vampire, you don't think about that character as being sympathetic. You think of that character as being terrifying. Always um, soft spoken. Never heard him raise his voice. Uh, he disagreed with things at times, but I never heard him raise his voice, and he was always a gentleman in that old-fashioned sense, and it was a manner that he, I think he wished to be that way. He was by nature, but he wished to be received that way, and you know, when you act like that, people take care of you that way. Yeah. Fans react to you that way. He was a uh, uh, he was something very special. We're all fortunate to have worked with him. And for me, that that was the first, quote, star that I worked with. It gave me such a good feeling about how people can conduct themselves in the business. He was a good, kind man. I There was a time I had had a, uh, uh, a medical event happen to me, and I had to call him from the hospital and tell him I couldn't come down the next day. And actually, I didn't even have a way to get home. It was very sudden, and I couldn't get a hold of anybody. And I was trying to figure out how I was going to get home. And he asked me, and I said, uh, you know, I, I need somebody to come get me and take me home. And they won't let me go. Well, he came up uh, to where I was in Midtown and took me all the way up to the Upper West Side where I lived and actually stayed with me till I fell asleep. I mean, this was the kind of person he was. He did that for many friends. Uh, it was nothing to him to help him help a friend, you know, sick, who, who was just, you know, so terribly sick, sit there, take care of him. I mean, nurse made him, really. Um, he was a very, very kind man. Um, uh, and I can't say that enough. What I did love about him the most was his sense of humor, because our sense of humor was exactly the same. And I loved the fact that he was somebody who could talk about 50 things in an hour, like I can. And I never knew anybody like that. And those were the things that I liked about him and missed about him. For his, his uh, year of passing, a bunch of friends and I are going to Pete's Tavern to celebrate his life because that's where he liked to go in New York a lot. So we're going to his favorite restaurant and we're going to raise a glass to him. That's what we're going to do on April 14th. <laughs> By the way, it's been a pleasure. It has been a, a, a really, it has been a pleasure to do that work. I've been, I sat there for about two hours at least, I think, without stopping. And the people that come up to you closely, I know some of you, I had sort of, you know, but I saw so many faces. I don't, I haven't, I, I don't know quite how to, what I to say about it, but it's an experience to see so many people that come by you and they want to make contact with you. 
And of course, you haven't got the time to really do it. But you, I, do, I try to look at them, and I do look at them. Look at all of you that come by. And uh, it's, that in itself is an experience. Um, it's just, it was, it's been a lovely evening, a lovely, just a lovely day, lovely two days I've been here now. And, uh, but that's, that was kind of a highlight tonight. Of just doing, signing.